We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. G'day, welcome back to this co-video edition of Space Junk Podcast. I am your host, Annie Handler, and joining me via video link is the wonderful Peter Lebedev, also known as Science Peter, who has stolen my background. Peter, would you say hello? Hello. Uh, Peter's fine. Science Peter was my dad. That's a stupid joke. Hello. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, like virtual backgrounds are cool. Like you can steal people's backgrounds in Zoom. I love it. Um, and you made the mistake of like leaving, leaving the frame and I quickly took a screenshot and I was like, great. This is my background. I have many more if we want to, we'll get to, we'll, we'll descend into madness later. Uh, this one's great. I really like it. That's pretty quantum mechanics in action. Excellent. Like all the different colors, right, are the, related to the energy levels of the electrons. So that's really neat. Yeah. Like without quantum mechanics, you don't get aurora. You don't get colors in general, but that's a long separate story. I should probably introduce myself. Is that what I was meant to be doing? That is what That what would be I was ideal, be yes. So hi, I'm Peter. Um, I'm doing a PhD in physics education research at UCID at the University of Sydney, basically trying to figure out how to teach physics better specifically for like multimedia stuff like online videos which is actually really 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 relevant now um but yeah we'll see so and in my spare time i do a bunch of science communication that's actually how i met annie we did a a talk at astrofest a couple of years ago we did right? mine was about like general like planetary science stuff and annie went crazy about space junk it was really cool um, uh, actually, yeah, we were space... fast friends ever since. Yeah, the space junk talk I did is on my YouTube channel as well. Um, so you can check that out. I think it's called Space Junk, a mess of epic proportions or something like that. And Peter, is your talk yeah. up anywhere? If people want to read No, 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 no. Uh, I kind of think that different mediums kind of demand different things. Does that make sense? I find the vast majority of the time a live talk is special because it's a live talk not because the content is particularly amazing mm. right it's it's like the the atmosphere and the vibe and all of those kind of things so um i don't tend to put up any of the stuff that i do live on youtube but it's just like a pers personal preference and that very much might change but mm. i feel yeah like youtube is a place for kind of quicker more edited more kind of you know, just snappier things, uh, sure. which this is not going to be, but like, this is a very specific, you know, format and you're making it for the internet rather than having something in real life, you know, and then converting it to the internet. Plus I just find like, I don't know, filming it is a hassle. I film all of my talks, but like only to review them. Like, I'm sure I have the footage, but like, yeah, I don't plan to put any of it up some anywhere. Come well, see me live in 20, 2021. In 2021. Yes, it is increasingly hard to see people live. Um, mm. it, looks, it looks like everything is cancelled for a while. I think I was, uh, yeah, just everything is, is postponed or cancelled. But I am hopeful we'll go back to doing things live. Because I agree, there is something magical about giving a talk to a live audience and about the kind of collective experience of that mm -hmm. is an energy mm -hmm. to it that often, you know, really lame jokes sell really well in a live yeah. setting where they don't on a video. No, they don't. And it's, I think it's the kind of, there's stuff in music about how music isn't, uh, there's an Adam Neely video really recently where he talks about like musicking, which is like experiencing and partaking in the music rather than just like listening to it. And I think there is a similar kind of experience here that instead of it, you know, like like we're, we're when you're at a live thing, you are collectively partaking in this thing with, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of hundred other people all around you or like a couple of dozen, you know, while 
I don't know. It's just not the same thing as watching YouTube at 2 a.m., right? And the things I work on YouTube at 2 a.m. don't work. Yeah, it's just I, like I, different mediums, I think, have different affordances to them. And you should, like, I, I try to, yeah, I don't know. It's probably dumb. Um, I probably should be putting content everywhere because welcome to capitalism. But, but yeah. at the same time, this is what you study. So, I mean, what is it that works on videos and in communicating science <laughs> through that mechanism or through that media that would not work? in person or vice versa well so 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 like i study not really science communication i study explicitly like physics education stuff and the basic idea with any learning is that if your brain isn't hurting you're not doing it right like oh. your your mental effort needs to be high your cognitive load needs to be high you need to after working or studying or learning something you should be feeling like you're wearing a, like a hat that is like a couple sizes too small you know like that feeling um, it's kind of the equivalent of going to the gym. Like if your muscles aren't sore, like then or the day after you probably didn't, you know, that was probably kind of like a recovery session and those are important, right? Like, but that's not when you're actually putting, you know, building muscle mass or whatever you care about. Right. It's kind of the same thing with education. If you're not kind of mentally sore after a study session, uh, you're not really, you're probably not learning too many things. And the, the problem with education on, on YouTube, right, is the incentives don't align, right? The incentives for you as a, you know, a creator, right, is try to get as many clicks as possible because then, the you know, the number of views directly affects, you know, whether you can pay rent or not. Mm. And the... Like the, the real trick here is basically interactivity and making sure like asking people questions and making them stop the video and like think about something or write down an answer, things like that. And that's what we do, you know, in universities, right? At least when the, 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 the pedagogy is good, it's frequently not. Um, but yeah, it's again, like different, different kind of contexts and different purposes. So, mm. yeah. What got you interested in education of science, specifically physics? I mean, like, so the, the, the physics part is easy. Like, I just really like physics. I don't know so much about the, I don't know. I was always kind of like interested in how to, how to explain things, mm. right? Because there, I, I, I always found that when I was learning something, like things would not click, they wouldn't click, they wouldn't click. And then someone would phrase it in a certain way or I'd connect some kind of dot, right? Like I'd just draw a line between, you know, like think about something in a different way and like everything makes sense. And then like, that's a really cool feeling, hmm. right? Like for me, and it's really cool uh, to kind of try to find those. The idea is kind of like a threshold concept if you want to look it up in the literature later, but like the, those kind of things are really great. You know, when, when, you get something new or when you, you know, help explain to a student something that's really cool i think i think primarily as well i'm just really interested in science communication because it's such a creative field right there's so much obviously there's a lot of a, a science to it and you're talking about science but fundamentally it's a pretty artistic thing right like you're you're being an entertainer you're being you know you're filming videos, you're editing videos, right? To, to say that's not creative, right? Like it, it's very obviously a creative field, right? But it's a creative field about science. I'm like, mm. that's neat. I like creative fields. Yeah, it is highly creative. Um, I like, I normally work in podcasts. So mm -hmm. that I find, I almost think about it in terms of dimensions and as an audio medium, a podcast is kind of like a two dimensional medium. I only have to worry about the audio and it makes for a really interesting experience. Um, because when I'm recording with someone, often when I'm recording audio with them, my job as the interviewer is purely to make that person in that moment feel comfortable and feel listened to 
and to encourage them along paths of interesting material that I think will make for good audio mm -hmm. and maybe steer them away mm -hmm. from paths that I think won't and mm -hmm. ask the right questions or even in some cases make the right faces at the right moment. But it's just me and that person and we're like two dots connected by a line or, or a flat plane, which is the audio with like, and I think about it with the, the waves going across and maybe that's because when I edit, um, I'm looking at the sound waves. And I love doing that because when you're talking to someone and you're editing afterwards, you can hear when they get excited because the sound waves get bigger and they get louder and the, they have fewer pauses between. And you can see when they're thinking a lot because there are you know, bigger gaps between each mm -hmm. word or each phrase. So that's kind of fascinating. Whereas making videos is a completely different thing because I have to not only make you as science Peter feel comfortable in what you're saying and encourage you in, in saying what I think will be interesting for whoever is out there watching this thing. But I also uh, have to think about how I'm coming across visually to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And sometimes making a face at you and being like, maybe I'll go down that path. Like that's not something that my audience wants to see because it takes yeah. away from the magic of the, the medium and the magic of what they're consuming in that. I find that quite interesting. Yeah, but the thing is with, with video, right? The, the kind of stuff that you tend to make tends to be a little bit more like open format and it's a little bit more raw and like sure you edit things right but it's not this like super snippy fine-grained you know kind of radio lab kind of editing right mm. it's not 99 percent invisible while if you're trying to really tell like an interesting complicated story on video mm. right you you kind of have a script right like th this is different this is a, a you know this is basically a podcast with visuals right and they're you know the visuals are fine but they're 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 you know a background um while i don't know the, the kind of stuff that i'm personally really 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 interested in is kind of that documentary filmmaking side of things uh -huh. Right, because for me, like like what you're talking about with dimensions, it's it's really interesting because I kind of view it as there has been like books or just sentences or you know poetry that has like moved me to tears, right? And the same thing has happened with music, right? Like that's actually the strongest thing. Like if you want to make me cry, just play me some beautiful music. Right. And like, I've also feel very, very strong emotions with like imagery, right? Like, so, you know, beautiful art, beautiful photography, beautiful videography. And what things like documentaries kind of allow me to do, right? And I haven't done this, obviously. It's very, very hard to do, is ideally try to kind of align those three things, right? So there's beautiful, a beautiful script, right? And then there's beautiful audio that includes like the music and the narration. And then there's also beautiful visuals to accompany that. Mm. Right. And I, I think, I think, you, you know, when you look at like uh, that video of Carl Sagan's pale blue dot, right. Like that's floating around on YouTube. It's actually from the audiobook recording of pale blue dot. Right. And the, the audiobook just has his narration. It doesn't have, you know, the mogwai underneath. It doesn't, it's, it's not mogwai. It would the, like the video there is like the original like Evangelist score for mm. Cosmos, but like if you don't have that music and if you don't have you know the beautiful script and then if you don't have the actual picture, I don't think it's like as punchy, right? I don't think it would have hit so many people in the fields in the same way, mm. right? So yeah, I just I just think that's really cool, and that's the, the the exact same thing with live presentations, right? Like I love live presentations because again, you can kind of do the same thing, right? Again, these are things that are very 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 hard to do, but you know, theoretically, you can align these things. Yeah, you know? I think with live presentations, the thing that I really like about doing that is that you can feel the energy in a room, and um, you can kind of, an audience can forgive things. I think because the audience sitting there knows you're standing in front of them delivering something live. It's, if you 
say something that isn't as interesting or that mm. you, know, you, you stumble over something or you make a joke that's a bit lame, they, they'll forgive it because they're there with you and you've hopefully built up enough rapport that you can get away with it and even mm -hmm. turn it into something later. Um, so you're kind of feeling what's coming at you from the, the audience and then giving back mm -hmm. what they need and what they want. But with a video, yeah. if someone doesn't like what you've said or someone doesn't like the way that you've presented it, they just close the window. And that is something, so you don't have that exchange with them. There's not as much forgiveness on both sides, I think. That's something that I think is really interesting with online teaching. So for the last two years, I've been teaching online in the history and philosophy of science department. And I teach a course called science ethics and society, which is just as wonderful as it sounds. But one of the things we instituted two years ago was online tutorials. And so they have the students have one in theory in person tutorial and one online tutorial. And I had to figure out how to teach content online. And something hilarious that kind of happened was, um, especially last year when we did this, a lot of the students didn't realize that there was a person at the other end. So they'd get something saying, you know, Annie liked your post or Annie commented under your post. And they thought Annie was the name of the AI that was in the background of the Canvas app. And it wasn't until near the end of semester where finally, because I had like 90 students, I had to put out a video giving group feedback on something. So I just like literally filmed myself talking that the students realized yeah. I was a person. And it was amazing. But also like, wow, wow, this AI is so advanced. It filmed yeah. a video of itself. And then like the quality of responses I got and the, the, quali like, the quality of inputs I got because they knew mm. that it was a real person at the other end commenting on their stuff and, and reading every word that they wrote um, went up so much. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a really interesting thing that um, I it was a lesson I learned is that AI just doesn't cut it. Like it's got to be real and students, they can tell these, these students have grown up in an era of the internet. And so they, they know what's expected of them when there's a person but there's a different sure. level expected of them when it's internetness. Sure. Yeah, I, but, I think I think that's totally fair. But do you think when you think about physics education and the way that we teach physics, do you think that that has to change with the way that kids grow up? So is today's cohort of physics students the same audience as a cohort of physics students 30 years ago in terms of what works no. for them? No, of course not. Mm. Right. I mean I mean uh, 30 years ago, we didn't have, like, when, when was the iPhone released? 2007? Like, 13 years ago, right? The world has changed so dramatically, and the things that, you know, I, I'm not sure how strong the literature is on this, but, like, things like attention spans, right? Like, I'm not sure how many people read books compared to 30 years ago. Hmm. Right. And I'm not like, this is not a, like a value judgment. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. Right. But yeah, like the, the, the if you keep making references, I don't, I, I think it's really important that when you teach, you try to find things that are like interesting to the students. Right. And there's like intrinsically interesting things. Like you can talk about the, you know, the interesting and cool physics, or you can tie things back to, you know, pop culture. And if you keep making pop culture references from the 70s, right, like, which is what a lot of physics lecturers did when I was an undergrad, maybe they're not so relevant anymore. Like, so, so just a thing like that, like, I don't know, include memes every once in a while. Like, that's a big thing. Shall we look at the space treaty? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about space. Let's yeah, let's talk about talk space. talk about something I know nothing about. Perfect. This is ideal. Um, so I told Peter, we're going to cover the last paragraph of Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty. And that's a privileged position, getting Article 1. I mean, not just anyone gets Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Very, very sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I want you to it's know very that. sweet. I'm very honoured. I'm honoured. But the third paragraph of Article 1 says, 
There shall be freedom of scientific investigation in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. And states shall facilitate and encourage international cooperation in such investigation. And so my question for you, Peter, is in the era of the Cold War, if you can place yourself for a moment in that context, imagine yourself in 1967. What does mm -hmm. it mean to say that there is freedom of scientific investigation in outer space? I can't believe we're going here already, but what is science, right? Well, this is my, yeah, look, you've, you've preempted the question I was going to throw at you. I was trying to lead you into it gently. I didn't want to horrify you too early, but I mean, what is scientific investigation? And how Well, scientific... anything goes. Sorry, go on. I am, I am, a, I have recently become a fan of Fire Robin, and it turns out that with, you know, scientific methodology, anything goes. Right. Uh -huh. Total, you know, yeah, that, that's me. That's me right now. So what did you used to think science was? It, it was, it was a, a method. You did observations. You looked at the world. You theorized things and you tested these things. And it was just like, like that is still science, right? Like I still think that is scientific, right? Or can be scientific. It's just... It's not just that. It is much, much broader now. Like for, for me, like that's how I conceptualize of what science is. It's like, I don't know. So many things can be science and so many, like, so many things that we think aren't science-y are actually science. Yeah. And so many things that we think are quite science-y are actually not science at all. Right. And that's, you know, can you give us I don't an know. Example? When, when, of the former, I think, I, I don't know. Um, a bunch of stuff in like, I don't know, behavioral economics, I think kind of got a bad rap a little while ago. Um, but it's it's so sciencey, right? And like, an another thing that I think is really important is that um, as a physicist, I used to conceptualize science as only like the deepest, most fundamental kind of look into reality, like trying to you know, understand how quote unquote the universe works. Mm. Right. But now I kind of think of it as, you know, just because I don't know, studying, you know, psychology or behavioral economics or physics education research or anything like that doesn't give us, you know, a fundamental insight into, you know, I don't know, particle physics or consciousness or anything like that doesn't mean it's not really, really useful. Right. And like, I don't know. Again, again, I like I have a hard time talking about what is and what is in science, right? But I know that knowing that, you know, Germany has a ninety something percent organ donation rate and Austria has twelve, right? Um, and the only difference, the only really big difference between these countries is opt-in versus opt-out organ donation, right? Like I know that's really interesting. And I know that that is something that, you know, can save, you know, literally thousands of lives, mm. right? And again, like, again, I'm, I'm not sure if I care if that's science or not science. I just know that it's useful. Do you have any thoughts on science and science that's done in outer space? Kind of a problem that I have with this last paragraph is that, yeah. like, states shall facilitate and encourage international cooperation in such investigation. Yeah. Well, previously it talks about in the first paragraph, it says, irrespective of the degree of economic or scientific development. And it's kind of right. like, you're, you're saying that, you know, <laughs> it says, it kind of holds scientific investigation as this like really, really high and important and lofty goal, mm. right? But right at the beginning, it says, hey, like, you know, it should be carried out in the benefit for everyone, right? And it doesn't matter what their economic or scientific capabilities are, mm. right? I don't know. It just this this just feels like this is written by someone uh, that by a country that already has a bunch of you know power in space, right? Well, I suppose it's the essence of something written by committee. I mean, getting something through yeah. the legal subcommittee of the United Nations um, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space is 
a lengthy process and involves a lot of negotiation. And so often there's a weird kind of tension and balance between concepts. Um, mm. I think, yeah, so Peter was referring to the beginning of Article 1, which I'm just going to read quickly. The exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries, irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development, and shall be the province of all mankind. And then it says, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be free for exploration and use by all states without discrimination of any kind, on a basis of equality and in accordance with international law. And there shall be free access to all areas of celestial bodies. And then we get the bit about there should be freedom of scientific investigation in outer space and states shall facilitate and encourage international cooperation in that investigation. Right, so you're saying in the context of the entirety of Article 1, it kind of stands out as a bit odd? I don't know, like define scientific investigation, right? Like, and, and what happens when these things are in direct contradiction to other things? Such as? Right. Like the, so, so what's the one with, that says he can't build a Death Star? Oh, uh, yes, Article uh, 4. Uh, um, yeah, so, okay, so, so. Right, yeah, so like, Article 4 says, don't put nukes in space. And then it says mm -hmm. that the moon and other celestial bodies shall be used by all states parties to the treaty exclusively for peaceful purposes. The establishment of military bases, installations and fortifications, the testing of any type of weapons and the conduct of military maneuvers on celestial bodies shall be forbidden. The use of military personnel for scientific research or for any other peaceful purposes shall not be prohibited. The use of any equipment or facility necessary for the peaceful exploration of the moon and other celestial bodies shall also not be prohibited. I don't know. Um, we talked about this a little while earlier, but there is... Um... The project when the U.S. thought about nuking the moon. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, one of the reasons that they decided against it is that because they were going to do it after Apollo 15, mm. right? Like to 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 basically have a bunch of seismometers on the moon and then like set off a small atomic explosion, smallish, right? Atomic explosion to see kind of the, the 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 internal structure of the moon right basically without going into too much geophysics right like pns waves different types of waves travel differently through you know different things right yeah. so you can determine a, a lot about the geology of the moon like we that's how we know uh that the earth has the structure that it has this for seismic testing Right, a lot of it with conventional explosives, a lot of it with, you know, um, there was a bunch of research back in, I guess the 50s and the 60s about, you know, trying to use seismometers to pick up, you know, the locations and kind of the yields of atomic bombs, right? Mm -hmm. That were being tested by either Russia or, or the Soviet Union or the uh, United States, right? And they were kind of planning to do the same thing for the moon. And like that, that sounds well, like that sounds like a horrible idea, right? But it's actually a scientifically pretty cool thing to do, mm. right? Like I, it would be cool to basically do to image the subsurface of the moon, right? With this kind of you know depth. Um, and the, it seems like the only reason that they decided against it, right, I'm trying to pull up the article now. I saw this floating around. Um, they, they, the only reason they decided against this is because they also wanted to measure kind of the, the, the natural amount of radioactivity uh, that the moon had, right? So, yes, there we go. Found, found the, the article. Uh, it's called Scientists Without Withdraws Plan for Nuclear Blast on Moon, right? Uh, and blah blah blah. 
But he said in a news conference that other scientists who have experiments planned to measure the nature, natural radiation around the moon convinced him such an explosion would be a bad idea because the radiation it released would create an interfering background noise that would spoil these experiments. Mm. So they're planning to do this in 1969, right? They're planning to do this in 1973 years after the Outer Space Treaty, right? And like, yeah, I kind of, just like that, that poses a really interesting question. On the one side, don't have nukes, but on the other side, what if, you know, it's not a nuke for war, it's a nuke for science, right? Because you can make the argument that like, what is, what is the difference between um, kind of the, the, the radioactive, you know, energy source of, you know, the Voyagers and the Pioneer probes and, you know, all the Mars rovers. Mm. What is functionally the difference between an RTG and, you know, a nuke? Sure. Of course, there is a bunch, right? But to a layperson, right? I'm not sure. Like, fundamentally, you're still sending a bunch of radioactive material up into space, right? Mm. The intentions are different, but... Uh, yeah, I tricky. think especially, especially in the context of the Cold War, it, it was even more messy. Um, Mm. To, to be able to say is this a nuke for scientific purposes or a nuke for uh, war fighting purposes or is this somewhere in the middle where we're showing what we can do scientifically in a conspicuous way in order to therefore bolster our um, reputation or fear factor in terms of our military capability the, but that was the whole point of the space race in general right it was just like this really really sexy way to show off that hey we have a bunch of rockets that can fly far like if they can fly to the moon, they can fly to Moscow, right? Yeah. But I think international law has had a really hard time trying to define what is science. I mean, in the Japan whaling case, for example, um, they kind of didn't really want to go into what it means to do something for scientific purposes. And I believe that I, I'm not, I'm a little hazy on it because it was many years ago that I studied this, but I'm pretty sure that in the end, the court was like, we're not going to rule on what is scientific, but we can rule on what for the purposes of means and we'll go on that basis. And oh, wow. I, yeah, I could be wrong. I mean, let me know in the comments. Um, but I think that when it comes to defining what is science, it's not only you or I who has an issue doing that, it's also law and particularly international regulation. And so it becomes, it moves from what is a philosophical problem that you and I can discuss over a cup of whatever we're drinking, uh, over a video chat. It moves from being, you know, an interesting exercise to being actually incredibly relevant for the purposes of what we allow, what we don't allow internationally. And then that has flown effects for things like export regulations on technology. So if you're in America, you can't yeah. export a whole bunch of scientific, or you can't share scientific information if it falls into certain categories where it could have military uses or um, various other things. There's a lot of regulation around that. And so I think that... That's so hectic. I think that this uneasy tension which you've brought up that exists in Article 9, uh, sorry, Article 1, and then is more explicitly discussed in Article 4, is something that is deeply important and deeply complex um you know not just for you but also for the people who wrote this thing mm. i'm sure that they also were aware of that tension and nonetheless though they chose to call out that science is okay and i find that really interesting i think the other interesting question here is why why is science singled out, you know? Why, like, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, like, okay, so my, now there's a huge spider outside my window, Jesus Christ, Australia. Um, <laughs> that is the most Australian thing. Yeah, it's so good. I mean, it's horrifying, but it's pretty Australian. Can you throw so, so, a roll of toilet paper in its direction or something? No, it's too expensive. Toilet, toilet, toilet paper is too expensive. Um, That's I mean, a great it's not background. Even expensive. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's it's a subtle flex. 
<laughs> conspicuous don't, consumption. I don't have anywhere near, don't have anywhere near the, this amount of toilet paper. Are you willing to disclose the amount of toilet paper you have at present? I think I have like seven or eight rolls. Oh. Right. I th yeah, it, it'll be fine. Yeah. Right. I think because I have, I think I have like maybe a couple more of the emergency ones. You know the the who gives a crap ones, the ones yeah. that have like emergency and they're like red and they're like hidden somewhere. Mm. I think I have a couple of more, so it'll be fine. I'll, I'll survive right. this pandemic. <laughs> That's also the um, most Australian thing to just be like, she'll be right. Anyway, she'll be right, but also saying. stay home, right? Like she'll be right, but like don't talk to people. Yeah. Or talk to people like far away. Um, this you're doing this for you know everyone. So, uh, yeah, I think I think been really really trying to figure out. I've been rereading Carl Sagan's Pay Blue Dot, right? Because Carl Sagan's great, um, and he's super soothing and calming, and we all need that right now. Mm. And I've been like really really trying to figure out why we. Like I place science in this kind of like privileged position in society, right? I think it's really fucking important, right? And I really, really think that it also allows science to get away with certain things that are kind of messed up, mm. right? Like you again, you look at you know the Manhattan Project, right? Or you look at hell, you look at NASA, right? And the people who, because this is going on the internet, I'm going to call, get called out. I'm choosing my words carefully. Um, some of the people that were involved in the space race in kind of both camps were not very good people. And yet we hold them up in the highest regard. Mm. Right. I'm looking at like Von Braun, right? Sure not a great dude right both personally and politically mm. right I actually don't know that much about personally but like he had the highest ranking that a civilian could could have in Nazi Germany right he basically like more people died from the slave labor camps that were building the A2 and the V2 rockets you know than the damage that was dealt by them but you know that's horrifying he had a bunch of friends and high places who were doing really, really horrible stuff, mm. right? And then um, due to Operation Paperclip and like the equivalent for USSR, right? A bunch of these German scientists, a bunch of these Nazi scientists, right? Um, ended up, you know, working for, you know, the American government and obviously also the, 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 the USSR, right? And like, that's tricky and that's hard and sure they're in a war and whatever, right? But like maybe still don't have medals named after this guy. Mm. Maybe don't give out awards. Maybe don't have, I, I find that really, really tricky, right? And because of people like this contributing so much to you know science and to space exploration, we can kind of forget these things and kind of move past these things. And I just find that strange, right? Because we kind of do an equivalent for that in music. And we kind of do the equivalent of that in art, mm. right? But we also very explicitly do that with science. And yeah, even, well, maybe... even like obviously much, much better people, right? Like who, who worked on, who, who weren't Nazis, who literally didn't kill people, right? Who didn't run slave labor camps, but who worked on the Manhattan Project, right? Why are they still so, so deeply adored by the physics community, right? Mm. Like, and like, maybe, maybe they should be, and like, I adore a bunch of them, but it's like, they also contributed to, you know, hanging the sword of Damocles above all of our heads, right? Like, you know, thank you for your contrib contribution to quantum field theory, right? But, oh my God, right, you were part of this. Like mm. that's tricky, and that's like really, really hard to reconcile. And I, I know we went totally off tangent here. No, um, I think it's really interesting. Um, I mean, with Werner von Braun, he appeared on Disney on kids. Yeah. Films. And yeah, yeah, I just in the seventies. 
yeah, and I'm really tempted to just insert um, Tom Lehrer's song, Werner von yeah, yeah, yeah. here, but I'll uh, yeah. I might link to it rather than get with the rockets piracy or whatever. Yeah, 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 yes. yeah. yeah. As long as the rockets go up, go who up. cares where they fall down? That's not my department, said the Werner von Braun. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what you say about us forgiving people in the arts, I think that it's like on a societal level, as fans, we forgive great artists their transgressions. And perhaps that's because we see the value of their art or the beauty of their art as superseding what they've done. Um, with notable exceptions, I mean, Harvey Weinstein, for example, is in jail, I believe, and I saw this morning. Good. Started that. Good. Right. But it seems like with scientists, they get forgiven at a governmental level. And there's something really different about that. No, I think there's a difference between being like a personally good person, right? But contributing to something really, really evil and like really that ends up being really, really bad, mm. right? And being an awful person, right? In, you know, with the actions that you do, that's not your work, right? Like yeah. how poorly you treat people, how, how much you abuse your power, things like that, right? And obviously both of these things are really, really, really bad, right? But we're so much more willing to forgive I don't know, like people call out Richard Feynman for his sexism more than his contribution to the Manhattan Project, right? That's weird to me, mm. right? Like, like, don't get me wrong, like not, not great, right? Like none of these things are great, but you know, and, and again, we're, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we need to be, you know, saying these people are the scum of the earth or anything like that. Um, Feynman actually writes quite eloquently about his feelings about the atomic bomb, but like after, it's kind of like, why didn't you think about what you're doing then, right? And I, I, get, I get the, you know, you know, society and, you know, culture was different at the time and, you know, you gotta beat the Nazis, all the things, blah, 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 right? But it's just so, yeah, this I don't know. The, Maybe the, Man the Manhattan Project isn't the best example, right? Because warfare somehow is different to, like, wartime is different to peacetime. Somehow, I don't know. This is like, I'm giving like the sil soliloquy while having like rolls of toilet paper behind I me. I think it's lovely. I'm all for it. It's, it's emblematic of our descent into madness. But I think there is something that you've picked up on that is really difficult about ethics. I mean, I teach ethics to people, mm. scientists, in fact, um, in undergrad. And one of the complexities that you run across is that ethics is not hard and fast. There's no right answer mm -hmm. often. And the way that we approach ethics tends to be to say, well, that was unethical. And what we're doing when we say that is it's shorthand for that caused harm. But as humans, we are really bad at differentiating between types of harm and severity of harm. And so we're more likely to consider yes. something that someone does to us or to someone that we know that could be quite minimal as unethical than we are to someone on the other side of the world who does something to people we don't know. Or even if we think about it, like I think, I think empathy is a massive part of ethics and humans are very bad at empathizing with and large numbers of I people. I think with the harm side of things, it's also really hard. Um, sorry, the sun is creeping up. I'm gonna have to close the blind soon. Um, I think it's also really, really hard because uh, more people die in car crashes, you know? More people have died due to car crashes than due to, you know, nuclear weapons, right? doesn't mean inventing the car was unethical. Mm. Like, was that inventing the car more unethical than inventing the nuclear bomb, right? Like, if you're doing, like, a utilitarian, like, a really, really simple, very, very, like, first order utilitarian calculation of how many people died because of this thing, then yes. But, like, that's obviously not the right way to think about this, right? Mm. I mean, like, what you're saying, like, there's different levels of... there's. The, Ethics is very complicated, and this is why I study physics, right? <laughs> like, physics is simple. 
um, yeah, there's different levels of all of this, right? There's so many dimensions to all of these kind of things. And yeah, again, like I'm no joke. This is why I study physics because like I don't have the brains for ethics. But I do think it's so important that people think about this because something that I mm. tell the students who I teach or give talks to is that they're not necessarily going to know all the answers and they won't necessarily make a decision mm -hmm. that they look back upon as right. But at the same mm -hmm. time, if they don't think about what they think is allowed or not allowed or what they think is good and bad or acceptable and not acceptable for themselves, then companies giving them money to do scientific projects are sure as hell not going to think about it for them which yeah. is another way of saying that they will just give them money to do that scientific project. And there are different ways of approaching it. I mean, I've met scientists in my research who say, well, it's better that I take money from weapons companies because the money I take to do my science is not being used to do something uh, like build a weapon. I know what I'm doing is a scientific thing that I think is okay. And I think the applications of it are non-weapon related and won't kill people. And so that's one way of looking at it. And another way of looking at it would be that utilitarian kind of perspective of, well, you know, I work on the Manhattan Project. I build this bomb. By building this bomb, I prevent war from sure. erupting more widely. And it becomes this race of technological capability. And sure. at the very least, I'm in sure, a job sure, sure. and blah, blah, blah. So there's different ways of thinking about it. And I'm very wary, I guess, because I've done too much meta ethics of saying that one is right and one is wrong but i do course, think that you, it course. is no longer acceptable and maybe it was never never was accept, acceptable just not to think about it at all yeah I, I i think i think so many people also say right say the people who worked on the manhattan project who say you know you know i just did my job and i didn't really think about it mm. i don't think that's true Right. I don't I, like I can't imagine, you know, these absolutely brilliant people not thinking about, you know, like you can only think about nuclear physics for a set number of hours a day. Right. Surely at the end of your 16 hour shift, your mind begins to wander. And as you're falling asleep, you go, hmm, is building, you know, like Enrico Fermi, you know, he, he already built you know, a, a nuclear reactor, that's great, right? Like that, that seems like a quote unquote ethical thing to do, right? Again, like no right or wrong answers here, right? But, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be in any way, you know, it's not specifically designed to kill people. But if you're working on the Manhattan Project, surely you're, you're like they knew that they were building a bomb. Mm. Right. Not many people knew, but the scientists did. Right. They the, the Oppenheimer like petitioned basically really hard to make sure that the scientists had more information than basically anyone else. And they definitely knew what they were doing after the Trinity test. Right. Mm. Most of the key players were there. Right. They saw the destructive power of that thing. Right. And was it too late by then? I don't know. But like I think they thought about it. Right. And then they decided on a decision. And again, I'm not saying if it was right, if it was wrong, but yeah, like, like I, I'm with you. I think it's, it's hard. It's hard to be prescriptive, right? Because I, I struggle with much, much, much smaller things, mm. right? Uh, I struggled with whether I was asked to be like, like a kind of a science talking head person on Sunrise last year. And I really, really struggle with that because that is, you know, uh, part of a news company that pays money to racists, right? Like not good people. And I kind of justified it with, well, fine, I'm not going to be talking about anything risque, right? Here's a little kind of like short, sweet spiel about, you know, the circadian rhythm and, you know, whatever, right? And plus any time that I'm on there and science is on there is a time that a racist isn't. But like, again, I really, really struggled with a simple decision like that. Mm. And there's plenty of other decisions that I struggle with of, 
oh, this person was, you know, accused of sexual harassment, right? By a bunch of people, you know, and like the companies that were involved didn't find this person guilty, mm. right? But if this person tours, you know, Australia, and if I get asked to host this gig, would I host this gig? And the answer is, I don't freaking know. Sure. Right? Like, because on one side, no, I really don't want to, right? But like being very, very kind of open and vulnerable here, it's kind of like, how, I don't know, right? Like, it's, it's, it's hard, right? Like, but- what, what gigs do you say yes to? What gigs do you say no to? And like, how do you make that decision, right? And I think that it's hard. I think it is hard and complicated. And I think maybe this is what maybe this is what the words that we've been reading attempt to get around by just saying science is different. We'll just we'll just do science over here and we'll just ignore everything else and we'll just say science is fine. Because if you're doing science, then you're in the pursuit of knowledge. And the pursuit of knowledge is in some way apolitical and non-ethical. And in the context of World War II and of Nazi Germany and et cetera, I think that that's naive in the extreme. But maybe where they got to was a similar place to where we've got to, which is to say, we don't know, but possibly by separating these things out, we can begin to do something and and not get stuck in endless philosophical argument because at the end of the day space is there and we want to go explore it so it's sort of a pragmatic yeah. solution to a thorny problem yeah but i think it's for for, for me i i think i've come to pragmatic solutions to thorny problems as well mm. right with i don't know i really don't like the amount of surveillance that google is doing right i find it horrifying and scary Right. Yet I upload things to YouTube. Right. That's one of the ways that I'm, you know, hopefully in the future planning to make my some of my income. Right. And And like that's that's weird. And you've been known to steal backgrounds. No, yeah, that's a separate, that's different. (laughs) Right. This is this is this is what like creative uh no 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 uh, fair use satire. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I think um, I, I, I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a lawyer of any kind, but yeah, I think I could claim fair use on this one. I think this is yeah satirical. I, I agree. Making fun of your black background. It's very. Well, I'm being very rude. Well, I mean, luckily for you, I will not be pressing charges. Peter, we should wind Good. up. Um, my final question to you is for people stuck at home. Uh, or wherever they happen to be during this time of lockdown slash self-isolation slash social distancing, what would you advise that people go away and Google or listen to or read or consume as we all consume content uh, or learn even? So um, what I would say is like, don't, I don't know. There's been a bunch of stuff about like the importance, like, of productivity right now and I think that's just like the wrong way to look at this time right there's all these people who are like oh Newton wrote you know the Principia during the Black Plague right or you know Shakespeare wrote this and you know someone else wrote that and I just like kind of think that a lot of uh, these kind of ruthless productivity things kind of got us into a bunch of trouble in the first place (laughs) <laughs> right uh by not providing things like uh, in america right by not providing like healthcare to, to to workers and everyone being casual and things like that so i wouldn't worry too much about like wasting this time uh so if you feel like you just need time to do nothing right and read whatever books that you like again like books that aren't for learning that are just fun right? Or if you want to play video games or whatever else, like by all means, please do that. Um, Saying that, if you want to, you know, be around kind of sciencey things, 
uh, there's a bunch of really good YouTube channels, right? So obviously like Garrick, like Veritasium, it's really great. I really like Smarter Every Day. I really like uh, Science Girl, uh, sorry, Physics Girl, Diana. She's really great. Uh, a bunch of my friends, right? Like Up and Adam and Tibbies, they do phenomenal science communication stuff. If you want to watch my videos that are a couple of, now a couple of years old, uh, my channel is Science Beater. Like, I think there's a couple of good ones. Like, there's a couple that I'm really proud of. And there's a lot of that I'm, you know, not very proud of, but that's okay. Like, you got to make mistakes to learn. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's about, about it. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been lovely. This I has feel... been fun. It's been cool to hang out. <laughs>